welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James. Welcome to episode two of the Madden America podcast. Thank you so much for your feedback on the first episode last week featuring Jim Gottstein. It's great to hear from you, and if you want to get in touch, you can email podcasts at maddenamerica.com. This week, we interview Dr. Mo Hanna. Mo is a professor of psychology at Siena College, New York, where she has taught since 1992 and a licensed New York State psychologist practicing with older adolescents and adults. Her clinical and research interests revolve around couples therapy, intimate partner violence and transpersonal psychology. She serves as the editor of Family and Interpersonal Violence Quarterly and has published seven books and numerous chapters and articles. In 2004, she co-founded and continues to serve as the chair of the annual Battered Mothers Custody Conference. Mo talks to us about her family experiences of the psychiatric system and how this has impacted her teaching and her approach to therapy. Mo, thank you so much for talking with me today. Could I start by asking you to tell me a little about your background and how you came to be involved with psychiatric medications? Well, I'm involved with psychiatric medications on several levels. Um, First, I have had a couple of my children who are now young adult children, um, one deceased, but one young adult child, both of whom were on antidepressants with some negative outcomes. Uh, But I'm also a psychologist. I practice uh, psychotherapy with clients, and I'm also a psychology professor at an undergraduate school uh, teaching psychology courses uh, in the area of clinical psychology, which is, you know, the psychological area that deals with mental illnesses and uh, treatments for mental illnesses. So I teach about uh, treatments and uh, study treatments and also have had my own personal experience. I myself was on an antidepressant for a number of years, um, although I have not been using uh, any kinds of psychoactive drugs in the last couple of years um, and have recovered quite well from all of that, which does not happen all the time and which was not the case for my daughters. Thank you, Mo. And I wanted to ask about your family experiences of antidepressants in the mental health system. I understand that both of your daughters, Monique and Alex, had experiences with mental health services. Could you help me understand their experiences? For example, what was it that led to Alex's treatment with antidepressants? Well, to understand what happened to Alex, you sort of have to understand what happened to my older daughter, Monique, who took her life at the age of 20. I'm so sorry to hear that, Mo. Around the time that that happened, of course, um, the, the family was devastated by this. It was very unexpected. And at the time, I had thought that Monique's death uh, by suicide was due to her depression. But in subsequent years, and especially in seeing uh, the experience that Alex has had in trying to withdraw from the drugs and learning more about the um, side effects, especially when people are first going on these antidepressants, as well as the withdrawal effects, I was more aware of side effects actually than I was of withdrawal effects in my earlier years. But mm. uh, still, not really cognizant of what these um, drugs can do, especially when you're going on them. And especially for certain people, because not everybody reacts the same way. Some people react extremely dramatically uh, with terrible symptoms, even taking one or two doses of these pills. Mm. And others seem to do just fine, at least for a while. In Monique's case, Monique was a a sophomore at NYU uh, taking acting training. And she was a, a, a really a brilliant actress and a very artistic type of person with a lot of um, strong emotions. And she became quite depressed. And um, around the time she uh, came home from school, from a school break around Christmas, uh, between, and it was during her sophomore year in college, as I said. And the natural thing that I thought to do, of course, was to refer her to a doctor, uh, and we, which is what we did. And, you know, it's a very long story and a very convoluted story, but uh, we did our very, very best to get the best treatment for her, both on an outpatient basis, um, seeing outpatient therapists, and also eventually um, putting her on an inpatient uh, ward for a brief period of time, a couple of brief periods of time. Mm. And what they basically did during the entire period she had gotten depressed or when she was seeking treatment, which was about a four-month period. It was not that long. She mm. was really only depressed for approximately four months mm. before she took her life. But one of the things that happened, two things that happened. One is that it was very clear to me that the therapists that were working with her, the doctors, were not really seeing the situation clearly at all. Mm. And were not they were missing the suicide, suicidal thinking. They were not paying close attention to it. And I kept trying to tell them, look, she, she says things to us at home that are very, very scary. Mm. Uh, and they seem to downplay that. The second thing that happened is they put her on and off various antidepressant medications. Mm. She would take them for brief periods of time. Uh, it was very difficult to get her to 
you know, to, to pay attention, you know, to, to do those things that other people were feeling were the best things for her to do. So she was going on and off these antidepressants. And um, at one point, um, she started to express suicidality. And um, long story short was she was in an inpatient setting uh, for a couple of weeks. Uh, they treated her with antidepressants. They, re they discharged her on antidepressants. She then saw a private psychiatrist who put her on another type of antidepressant. Mm. And then three days later, she took her life. So around that time, of course, what, after that happened, I was very concerned about my other children. At the time, I had three younger children. Monique was the, was the oldest. Alex at that time was, um, I believe she was 15, so she was uh, in high school. Mm. And uh, saw her pediatrician, and in a discussion with her pediatrician, decided that perhaps she should go on an antidepressant as a, as a precautionary measure because her, her sister had taken, taken her own life. Mm. Uh, looking back now, of course, a very foolish thing to do, uh, something I would never choose to do now. But at the time, it seemed like perfectly, absolutely the logical thing to do mm -hmm. and was recommended by her pediatrician. And I must say her pediatrician seemed a very, very good person, a very well-meaning person. Uh, and I don't think she in any way, shape or form herself understood what the possible implications were of putting Alex on an antidepressant, mm -hmm. nor did anybody at the time, anybody mentioned to me that Monique's suicidality could have been caused by the antidepressants, because I will tell you that she was not suicidal before she started on the antidepressants. Mo, firstly, it's tragic to hear that your whole family went through that experience. And I wanted to ask, in relation to how Monique was treated, what you felt led to that refusal by mental health services to listen to Monique, because it didn't sound like they listened to her or to you. You know, it's very hard to know why the mental health um folks did not listen more closely and did not guard her life more closely because it was very obvious to me once she became suicidal it was obvious to me that she was very suicidal uh, why these uh, physicians and uh, the people that worked with her for example in the last time she was hospitalized on a locked unit and then they discharged her and I told them I think she's still in danger and indeed she was because she took her life about a week week to 10 days after she was discharged why don't they listen it's very it's a very curious question I cannot really answer that I will tell you I'm a psychologist I'm a psychotherapist and I both based on that experience but really just based on my own training and my own ethics know that you have to listen very, very closely to the patients because they know themselves the best. Mm -hmm. And the other part, though, is um, this is a big issue that I think many people struggle with and suffer from. And I think many parents would agree with me that when you have a young adult child, Monique was uh, 19 at the time she became ill, mm -hmm. 20 at the time when she died. You have a child that age, once they're 18, they can pretty much... Um, uh, do what they want, uh, uh, legally speaking. And so the HIPAA laws, you know, the federal HIPAA laws state that, uh, you know, a, a parent cannot get information from a provider uh, about what is going on with their young adult child, an 18, 19, 20 year old. Hmm. Um, and so if the, if the, if the way that the deep uh, depression, for example, and this, do, this is the way depression sometimes presents, it's Depression, sometimes the so-called bipolar disorder, if there is such a thing, when people have relatively severe symptoms, very often they do become uh, negative towards the people they love. They become hostile. It's it's part of the condition, mm. and it needs to be worked with, and it needs to be perhaps gently confronted. Uh, but what happens is these care providers just pretty much cut out the parental voice. And I'm not talking about parents who are abusive. I'm talking about parents who are really trying to do their best to help their young person. And mm. as if the young person says, no, I want to deal with this on my own, even if they are in, in danger, uh, they're, they're pretty much um, not allowed to, uh, to, to uh, participate in the treatment. So that's one of the things that happened with, with Monique's care. So you can't say it was entirely the fault of the providers. Uh, Monique had her own voice, but it was also part of the condition uh, that Monique was going through, that she was not uh, willing to, to interact with, with me, which is very ironic because Monique and I were, as they say, like white on rice, we were as close as close can be. We were a very close mother-daughter type of, uh, we had a very close mother-daughter, really almost a best friend kind of relationship. So there were many factors that entered in, but certainly I believe at this point that the antidepressants pushed her over the edge. That is my belief. It's impossible to prove that, of course, uh, but she, as I said, she was not suicidal before. She was depressed, but not suicidal before she started on the antidepressant regimens. 
It certainly sounds like had the care providers listened both to Monique and to her family, and they'd paid more attention to Monique's needs, that this tragedy could have been prevented. And as you say, surely there must be a sensible compromise around listening to the family's needs in addition to those of even an old child. I can see that if the family wishes are not taken account of, that could easily lead to isolation. Oh yes, absolutely. You know, and and especially you know when you know that uh, you know, the, the brain doesn't develop fully now. We know now at the age of twenty five, and for all we know in 10 years, we'll say it's 35. Yeah. Uh, but a child of uh, 20 or a young person of 20, uh, their brain's not yet completely developed. And so when they have these kinds of mental struggles, uh, they really can't do it on their own. You know, mm-hmm. they really can't do that without family support. And I'm talking about good family support, loving family support, uh, not abusive family support. And, and certainly in Monique's case, as I said, we were uh, she, had a, she had a very strong family support system that was really pretty much cut out of the picture. It's clear, Mo, how close you all were. And I wanted to ask about Alex. I can't imagine the place that Alex must have been in having lost a sister in this way. How did that impact her? Well, she went to see a a pediatrician, um, as I said, and the pediatrician placed her on Lexapro. Mm. And uh, when Alex went on Lexapro, it, it you know, I don't remember because it was uh, that was many years ago. Alex is now 25, so that was when she was 15. Mm. So it was it was shortly after Monique took her life, and actually, um, shortly after that, uh, in, probably several months later, I myself went on Prozac, and I actually found a lot of relief being on Prozac. Was so one of the complicating factors for me has been. I have heard from people that they feel better on these drugs, and I will tell you that I felt better on Prozac. However, um, there's two things to that. One is that we don't know why you're feeling better. And my suspicion is that it really sort of numbs the brain, okay, mm-hmm. so that you you don't really – it's not really curing your depression. It's not really curing anything. Uh, basically, it's just sedating the brain, and you, you care less about what you are thinking and feeling. Mm-hmm. So that's, I think, part of it. I didn't also, when Alex went on the antidepressant, um, I cannot say that I noticed any severe side effects. Uh, but the, the big problem with, with Alex's treatment was uh, it was like nobody was really minding the store. And I, unfortunately, as a mother, um, was brainwashed about these drugs up until I really saw very clearly with Alex's withdrawal problems what these drugs do. And then I started to really dig into the research and the reading and um, learning about uh, the problems of these drugs. And so she was on, as I said, a long period of time. And I think this happens to many people. Um, you start on an antidepressant. Uh, you, you see your doctor every three months or six months or however often it is for a so-called med check. They talk to you for about 15 minutes. That's the model in the United States. Mm. And um, and then you just go on your merry way. And so that's what happened with Alex. And I think that happens probably with most people. It, it actually happened with me. Uh, you know, the, the doctors in no way, shape or form say, let's talk about how to get off these drugs. Let's talk about weaning off these drugs. Let's talk about what the possible side effects and withdrawal effects are of, of coming off these drugs. Not a word about that. Uh, not a word of caution about what can happen if you do try to get off the drugs. So I know what, what happened over the time with Alex is what Alex wanted to get off the antidepressants. Um, and uh, I think she, she probably started uh, to try a, a couple of times and had a difficult time and, and then just sort of abandoned that approach. But mm. she eventually did go off uh, when she was on a trip in South America. And uh, she actually weaned, um, not as slowly as you're supposed to, uh, according to the best authorities that we know now, um, which is surviving antidepressants and other people online uh, that really have studied this on a broad population basis, you know, from people who have reported about their symptoms. But she was smart enough to try to go off slowly, if not slowly enough. And um, at first she was fine. uh, But about three to four months after she withdrew, she started getting very severe symptoms. Uh, So she she literally stopped taking uh, the Lexapro um, after weaning. Um, and, uh, like I said, about three to four months later, she was, she was okay. She had some mild irritability, uh, symptoms, uh, some mild symptoms at first that she pretty much, I think, didn't recognize as withdrawal. And then, um, about three to four months later, she started having very severe symptoms, which one of the the worst and one of the earliest symptoms was she could not sleep at all. Mm -hmm. She had what you would call total insomnia. And I know this because I was um, very much uh, by her side during this whole period because she was in so much distress. So she was having a lot of um, anxiety, very, very high anxiety, um, a lot of obsessive thinking, a lot of rumination, a lot of guilt, feelings of worthlessness, really, really horrible stuff. And I will tell you, James, she 
never once in her entire life had symptoms anything like this. It was very, very clear to me it was drug-related, that it was not, quote-unquote, a mental illness returning, which so many people are told when they report this to their doctors. She never had anxiety. She, If anything, Alex was a non-anxious person mm. uh, and also a person who had great sleeping habits. Um, so what was going on with her, it was as though she was an entirely different person. Alex's experience has a great deal in common with others that I've spoken with, particularly that when starting these powerful drugs, not being given the information that she needed to make an informed choice. It's difficult to know whether prescribers know this and are trying not to scare their patients, or if they genuinely don't have the information or understanding to help their patient make a choice about benefits versus harms. That's correct. However, if you and I and so many other people who are working on this issue um, are able to find out this information, why can these doctors not find out this information? If they really interviewed their patients, if they really paid attention to what was going on while patients were withdrawing, and if they dug into the literature and started reading uh, um, material by folks like Whitaker and Bregan and all the others who are documenting these problems, they would have the knowledge and information they need uh, to warn people. Because, you know, if Alex had been warned by her prescriber, first of all, not to stay on it for nine years, mm. Um, you know, she was left on it for nine years and uh, without a word about withdrawal, she really chose to go through withdrawal herself. She was the one who decided to try to get off the drug. And in, in quite in all honesty, it was a very courageous thing of, of her uh, to do, uh, to go off her Lexapro without any real support from the medical system and doing her best to do it the right way and still suffering absolutely profound withdrawal symptoms. Mm. So the, the other part of this, James, is is just the, the, my own feelings about having been a psychologist who, while I was not I was not pro drug uh, prior to this, um, I had very mixed feelings about these drugs all along. Yeah. But I would never say to a client, if you you know, I, I would my typical position with clients used to be used to be it no longer is. Well, if you feel you want to try an antidepressant, go ahead and try an antidepressant. Mm. And I would do the psychotherapy part. Of course, as a psychologist, I don't prescribe drugs, can't prescribe drugs. I'm very happy I can't prescribe drugs uh, and work with people in non-drug techniques and mm. teach them self-help techniques and use various kinds of therapies. Um, and now, of course, my, my tune has changed. And I honestly do discourage people uh, from starting on the drugs if they haven't already started. And I absolutely warn people who are on the drugs about all the potential withdrawal effects, talking to them about the uh, the possible impacts of going off the drug. Although I also talk about the desirability of going off the drugs because these drugs are by no means are benign um, on the rest of the bodily sy systems, as we know. Mm -hmm. And um, I also talked to them about the 10% method. And by the way, I have also changed how I teach my students when I teach, for example, abnormal psychology, which I'm teaching this semester. Mm. Um, I talk about these drugs in very different ways than I used to. Well, Mo, thank goodness there are professionals like you who are willing to challenge the standard psychiatric model of brain abnormality and a biological cause of mental illness. Because... Psychiatry seems to have only one tool in the box, which is medication, and for many people that brings far more challenges than it ever resolves. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And of course, I have many, many clients who are on the medications, many clients who have gone on and off different medications, um, and uh, you know, not everybody has the same, as, as we know, not everybody has the same experiences with the medications. But uh, for those who have the bad experiences with withdrawal, uh, from what I can see and from what I've heard, it's probably the worst thing you can go through, just about. That is a commonly reported experience. And people will say that the wide range of emotional, psychological and physiological effects of withdrawal are actually far worse than the issues that the person needed help for initially. And that's absolutely true of Alex. Uh, even with the death of her sister and the, the, the reaction she had to the death of her sister um, was nothing like what she has gone through uh, as far as her withdrawal symptoms. Mm -hmm. I didn't think it was even possible for somebody to have these kinds of symptoms with, uh, as a part of withdrawal from, uh, from antidepressants. Uh, it, was, it was new to me. And, uh, and now, again, it has really changed the way I see the drugs, changed the way I talk to people about the drugs, changed the way I practice. In some ways, there's, you know, there's always good that can come out of these, these bad and dark things that happen. That's the, that, just even with Monique's death, it taught me a great deal about mental health and suicide and depression, and again, in, in retrospect, about uh, the, the cautions people need as far as ever uh, picking up that first antidepressant, because you really do not know what kind of impact it's going to have on the person, and it can do much more harm than good. I agree. And I wanted to ask, Mo, whether you feel like I do, that 
It's bad enough that these effects exist and there's little knowledge of them, but what's worse is the fact that an antidepressant is sold and promoted as a carefully targeted magic bullet that will correct a brain chemical imbalance. That's just mis-selling, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, the whole meme, the safe, effective, and non-addictive meme, none of those three are true. They are unsafe, they are ineffective in in the long run, certainly, and they are not non-addictive. In fact, I think there is a physiological dependence that people get on these antidepressants. I think the drug companies are aware of this. I think many doctors are unaware of this, but it's about time they do become aware of it. Thank you, Mo. And I wanted to ask, how is Alex doing now? Is she left with any lingering effects from her withdrawal, or has she got completely past the drugs now? She is recovering. Uh, she has been um, very, very slowly recovering. It's a, one of these very incremental recoveries. She had terrible symptoms um, last summer. When she first uh, started to get the symptoms, she went quickly downhill and she had um, obsessive thinking. She actually ended up having delusional thinking. Mm. Uh, she was at the point last summer, um, early withdrawal, I'd say the first maybe six months after the withdrawal effects kicked in, mm. um, where we really had to watch her every minute. It was as though you know, we pretty much had to keep our eyes on her because I was afraid of what she might do. Uh, but she has calmed down. Um, she is still not herself, but, she, but she's getting there. I can see her recovering. But again, it's very, very slow. Uh, almost painstaking. We're just taking care, you know, just giving her all the space and time she needs uh, to to heal. And mm. um, I, I fully believe she will heal completely. You know, the, the, the ironic thing about Alex is she's one of the most mentally healthy people I knew, mm. quite frankly, um, and especially for being such a young person. Uh, and then the symptoms she had were almost the absolute reverse. Alex also happens to be a very, very talented artist. And sometimes I wonder if some of her symptoms um, aren't uh, sort of related to her artistic mind. You know, she has a very, very deep subconscious that that produces this art. Mm. And uh, so her symptoms have been very cognitive, you know, very mental. Withdrawal does seem to be a system-wide thing. And certainly in my case, I wasn't prepared for its effects on my thinking, my emotions, my ability to socialize. We're not given the information at the start of drug therapy to understand what a challenge the end of treatment is going to be in our lives, are we? No, you have no idea. And I think probably if people knew what they would go through withdrawing, they probably wouldn't withdraw. And I really do have to wonder, and I, I don't know for sure, that if the drug the drug companies are not aware that these drugs are so hard to get off of that they have made, once people start taking them, they have made a lifelong customer. Well, there are certainly parallels there with the tobacco industry, aren't there, where dependence is almost a mechanism to guarantee future profits. That's absolutely right, you know. And uh, now, now, I will say this, ironic, sort of ironically, you know, I, I told you that I was on Prozac mm. um, after my, my daughter died, after Monique died. And I was on it actually for about uh, seven or eight years. Mm. And then I said, you know, and this was before I understood withdrawal effects, but I said, I'm done with this. I don't need it anymore. I didn't need it for a long, long time. Uh, but it, and you want, you don't, you know, when you, when you've been through an ordeal, a mental ordeal, you don't want to upset the apple cart. Uh, but I felt very ready to set, upset the apple cart at that point. I was on a sabbatical from school, from teaching, and I did go off. I did have some withdrawal effects for sure. It was difficult. Uh, but I managed without going through anything really even resembling what Alex goes through, mm. which shows you probably the difference across me. Perhaps some of the antidepressants differ from each other, and perhaps it differs according to the individual. That is a good point. And it does seem to be that just as people have markedly different response to antidepressant treatment, they also seem to have very different experiences of withdrawal. The number of people who think about withdrawal but get so worried about upsetting everything and not being able to work or to engage with their families, that leads to real pressure to not come off the drugs, doesn't it? Yes, there is. Yeah. And, you know, because you and you really don't know who who among all the people taking antidepressants are going to become disabled. So whereas I was able to continue to work and function, although, again, I had some uh, difficulty. It, most of my symptoms were emotional. I did a lot of crying. I cried at the drop of a hat. It was, you know, if things upset me easily. But that did pass. And fortunately, I spent many of the years after Monique passed um, working on myself in non-drug ways, so learning meditation, practicing meditation, um, exercise, uh, mindfulness, doing a lot of spiritual reading. All those things have really helped me to recover. And I really feel I, I very much did recover from Monique's passing. And, um, you know, and I think the, I don't know what the Prozac did, but I'm very, very happy to be off any kind of psychoactive drugs and would never touch them again. Uh, whereas, whereas with Alex, you know, Alex had... Uh, 
pretty much a disabling experience in withdrawal. Uh, and again, I, I fully anticipate her fully recovering. So I, that, that is not something that I, I am concerned about, but it has been, you know, she is not, she's been off just maybe a little bit less than a year now, and she is still not really fully herself. Recovery is a slow process, isn't it? And we're much more understanding and accepting of that message where illicit drugs are concerned. People know that it can be easy to get hooked and coming off can be difficult and recovery is a long process. But that's very different to the understanding of psychiatric drugs, which we believe are benign and safe and well tested and we know the facts about them. But the reality is very different, isn't it? Oh, it's very different. You know, when you're taking pharmaceuticals, you know, your doctor's given them to you. You trust, quote, you trust your doctor. Mm. How can you, how can you, Put your life in the hands of somebody you don't trust. So you trust your doctor. And if your doctor says these are safe, effective, and non-addictive, and it's not a problem taking that, and that's all I've ever heard from any doctor I've ever spoken with. Um, ironically, you know, in the in treatment, uh, the, the post-withdrawal treatment that Alex has gotten, and it has not had very good luck with that at all, mm. um, she, she sought out treatment at a local um, inpatient hospital on an outpatient basis. And uh, what do you think the first thing they suggested she do? What, what would you imagine they told her? She was presenting with these obsessions and the ruminations and insomnia. So what do you imagine that this psychiatric hospital recommended she do? Well, the first thing that I'd think is they probably suggested going back on the drug. Oh, they absolutely did. They they they, they suggested actually she go on two drugs <laughs> or they they recommended two different drugs. One affects her. Yeah. which is notoriously difficult to get off of, mm. uh, as is Lexapro, by the way. Lexapro has been named as one of the ones that's more difficult to get off. Effexor is more difficult to get off, and I've heard that Prozac's a little easier to get off of, although, again, people have different experiences. Mm. They also recommended uh, Remeron, which is another drug that I, I'm well aware of people who have been on Remeron and have had terrible withdrawal. Mm. So, you know, the the... the, the it's it's the hammer doesn't the, to to the hammer everything is a nail you know it's really that in in the psychiatric sy- system. She also sought out. I want to just mention this because this is something that your listening audience needs to know. She sought out treatment at a um, a natural um, a naturally oriented clinic in Arizona, Sedona, Arizona, called Alternative to Meds. And you know I really did feel I talked to them, sort of interviewed them, um, had her evaluated not not in person but her case evaluated several times before we brought her to this clinic for treatment. And they use like an orthomolecular approach. They use supplements, high doses of supplements, exercise, things along those lines. And they assured me that they knew how to treat withdrawal and that uh, they had successfully successfully treated withdrawal. Unfortunately, she was there for a total of nine days. I'm sorry. uh, I think it was more like 12 days. And um, she had a terrible outcome, quite frankly. She ended up um, being dropped off at an emergency room because she had fainted the night before. They left her there, and she was in such a – frankly, she was in such a delusional state. She was in a very confused state. She walked out of the emergency room, and she disappeared. She disappeared on the streets of Sedona for about five hours. And so we went through another – afternoon where I, I literally honestly James thought she was dead mm. uh, and uh, reminding me of what had happened when Monique died fortunately they located her and pretty much booted her out of there and we brought her home mm. um, and we, we also had an ordeal on the way home where she was in such bad shape and they took her off of an airplane um, the, the, the stewardesses were noticing that she was agitated took her off the airplane uh, the uh, airplane staff evaluated her said that she was not well enough to fly, and they brought her to a ER in Chicago, where they then transferred her to an inpatient setting, and she was forcefully treated with drugs for five days. So that's Alex's story. It's 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 more complicated than just going through withdrawal. It was mm. really seeking out the best treatment possible and really being um, – I, I really think that the vast majority of people, both alternative practitioners and uh, rather regular allopathic tra- uh, practitioners really don't know how to treat withdrawal. And I'm also convinced that what you need to do with withdrawal, and this is just my opinion based upon what I've read, uh, talked to people about and studying what has happened to Alex is people going through withdrawal just really need family and friend support. They need to be helped with nutrition, with good rest, and they need to be um, not treated in any kind of medical facility. That is my opinion based upon the experiences I've been through. I think that's really good advice, Mo. And you have more lived experience of this than many of the doctors prescribing these drugs. 
It's frustrating, isn't it? Because this issue is not that well known about, there isn't much impetus to do the necessary research on how to best help people in withdrawal. So people are finding themselves in the middle of it and having to adapt as they go. Thank goodness for communities like Surviving Antidepressants and the others too, because if it weren't for those people, we really would be flying completely blind when dealing with these issues. That's right. And as it is, you're flying completely blind. But when you're able to at least access information from people, as you say, with the lived experiences and you learn from them, um, you know, it, 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 it is very, very helpful. But what a pathetic situation mm. where this is such a common condition. It's an iatrogenic condition. It's being induced in people all over the world. And yet there is virtually nothing out there except on these few websites run by ordinary folks um, to help people to get through this horrific ordeal. That's true. And Mo, I just wanted to ask, in your capacity as a professor of psychology, you mentioned that you lecture to students. And I just wondered what the response was of your students when given this view of the drugs that's probably very different to the textbooks and the advertising. I just wondered how that was fed back to you. Well, uh, it remains to be seen because um, since, you know, Alex really just started going through withdrawal last year, Mm. uh, that is really what, what changed my teaching. And so I'm really in the very early stages of teaching students Uh, different ideas about these things. Mm. And um, I'm well aware that many of my students are also on antidepressants. I think the the, the rate of antidepressant use in uh, especially young females is very, very high. Um, Mm. There's some statistics out there, but I am certain of it. And um, so, so far, you know, I've I've noticed the students are not... um, they're not arguing back with me. Um, I've I've gotten a number of them to read some of the books that are posted on various websites that are contrary to the you know to the party line about antidepressants, mm. and uh, they've seemed they've actually seemed quite receptive. Um, this is still a work in progress. I'm still in the middle of a semester, and I still have more to tell them about um, the ins and outs of drugs. But I've taught to them. I've taught them things like the fact that the serotonin hypothesis is is really a crock, frankly, mm. and it. It was never really had any kind of valid scientific basis to it. And it just became pretty much a sort of an urban legend and showing them quotes from authorities that are actually admitting that, Mm -hmm. uh, showing them video clips with people like Robert Whitaker and um, quotes from other um, authors who are really in the know. So it's still a work in progress, but as I can as I can uh, assure you that I will never again teach the things that are in the textbook. And I it, the the irony too is that I use the textbook where they say the same old things that they've been saying for the past several decades. You know about the serotonin hypothesis and the dopamine hypothesis of psychosis mm. and how these drugs supposedly, you know, raise serotonin, which is in short supply, or norepinephrine, which is in short supply, you know, which as we know now is, um, is, is there's no basis whatsoever uh, for those statements. So I can see how powerfully this, this, how powerful this meme about the antidepressants are. I mean, it's really quite amazing. Um, when I was trained as a doctoral psychologist, I was trained at UCLA, like I was trained at the University of Arizona, but my my postdoctoral, um, my my doctoral uh, clinical training, uh, my year's worth of internship was at UCLA, and the model that was in vogue at UCLA was extremely biological psychiatry, yeah. and so they pounded into you like it's it's the it's like the sun rises in the east. Antidepressants are safe, effective, and non-addictive. That is that is the level of indoctrination. So. Even if I want to blame the doctors who are doing this, part of me says, well, you know what, I'm a, I'm a psychologist and I believed in this nonsense as well mm. until I saw it with my own eyes. I saw it with in living color unfolding in front of me. This is withdrawal. This is what this is what these brain, these drugs do to the brain. You're right. And it was shocking to me to find out how little we do actually know about mental health in general and how many psychiatric diagnoses are not evidence based. And therefore, if we don't know much about the conditions we're treating, by implication, we know even less about how these powerful drugs work. Right. And especially in the long term especially in the, in the long term. Since the studies have not been done in the long term, the studies have been done uh, in, you know, what is it, six weeks, perhaps, perhaps four months at most. Mm. Uh, the studies cover, uh, you know, the, the those time frames. But when you're talking about people being on these drugs, even two years, three years, five years out, you know, which many people do stay on them that long, mm. uh, that w- we know virtually nothing about that. We, we do know that there is a uh, there is a relationship between taking these kinds of drugs and lifespan. Mm-hmm. Uh, that the it actually shortens the average lifespan. So there's some very scary statistics out there that um, I think people really need to know, and they need to be pointed out to people 
uh, by people like me and and other people who uh, have access to uh, to getting information out to the public. Well, Mo, thank you so much for being willing to stand against the mainstream and teach the next generation that there are so many other more holistic ways of improving our mental health and well-being that are preferable in every circumstance to something that might seem like a quick fix but is anything but. Absolutely. And thank you again, James, for what you're doing. And I eagerly await every new uh, every new p- uh, podcast and look forward to listening to them all. Mo, thank you so much for talking about things which must be very difficult for you to talk about. And I'm very grateful to you for sharing your experiences with us. I'm sure others have said this, uh, but it needs to be said again that if your doctor uh, suggests putting you on an antidepressant, that you think long and hard before you take that first pill uh, and that you explore online all of the information that is out there, both pros and cons, mm. and that you also really make use of non-drug um, uh, techniques and self-help approaches because uh, things like exercise and meditation, which have very, very good research behind them now, uh, which demonstrate that in many, many cases of depression, anxiety, and other kinds of problems, you can uh, circumvent uh, and, and heal yourself, so circumvent the symptoms and heal yourself using these non-drug techniques. And then that this is something that you can practice for the rest of your life, as opposed to taking a pill that eventually, sooner or later, uh, will stop working and possibly cause you uh, your bodily systems harm. That's great advice. Thank you so much, Mo. It's been a pleasure to be able to chat with you today. Oh, well, thank you for having an avenue to do this. I mean, who else is doing this kind of thing? So, you know, thank you very much for for what you are doing too, James. Well, I'm sure you found the interview with Mo engaging and enlightening, and I'm really grateful to be able to share this interview with you. If you'd like to discuss the podcast or the issues raised, visit maddenamerica.com forward slash forums. Madden America News and Updates. Thank you so much for listening in today, and thank you also for your feedback and comments. If you do want to get in touch with us, you can email podcasts at maddenamerica.com. In upcoming events, we want to remind you that July the 11th is World Benzodiazepine Awareness Day. There are events taking place in many parts of the world, and for the latest news, you can visit the website wbad.org. That's w-bad.org. We will be releasing a special episode of this podcast on Tuesday the 11th, which will focus solely on some of the many complex issues around benzodiazepine prescribing. Thank you so much for listening today. If you are listening in iTunes, please consider leaving us a review because reviews and ratings really help to get more people listening to the podcast. Until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views and updates.